Thank you. Good evening. My name is Corey Weber. I'm an officer of the Ninth Circuit's Historical Society, also known as the NJCHS. We'd like to welcome you here tonight uh, for our program, uh, together with the James T. King Bankruptcy in a Court and also the Financial uh, Lawyers Conference. I won't take up much of your time tonight because we've got two great panels. Um, but just a word about the NJCHS. So for those of you that don't know much about the Historical Society, it makes history come alive through programs like this, through oral histories, our journal. It's great to get involved with. Uh, I encourage you to go to our website, njchs.org. Check us out. If you're not a member, please join. Um, also, a few quick housekeeping notes. This is also for the folks joining us via Zoom. For MCLE, for those in the room, uh, you need to make sure you're signed on. For folks on Zoom, you need to make sure you rename yourself on the Zoom with your name uh, that you used to register. And if you're on the Zoom on your phone, you need to email info at financiallawyers.org with your phone number and name. And then the society will send out an email after the program with the email address and everyone will receive their certificate and also evaluation uh, by email as well. So, so many people have made tonight happen. I want to thank our program planners, uh, our program partners for all the hours of thought they've dedicated to putting on the programs tonight. And thank you also to the court staff for making everything possible. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Caroline Chang uh, right after I introduce her. Uh, so Caroline is a shareholder at Buckalter, where she practices in the areas of insolvency, bankruptcy, and litigation. She's a subchapter five trustee and a certified mediator. Caroline is the president of the Orange County Women Lawyers Association and is also on the board of directors of the Orange County Bar Association. She served as a lawyer representative for the Central District of California and then on the Ninth Circuit's uh, Circuit Executive Committee. And she's also a member of the Advisory Committee of the NJCHS. More important, she's been a driving force in everything that has made the program tonight happen. So thank you so much to Caroline, our panelists. Enjoy the program tonight. Thank you so much, Corey, for that introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to start with brief acknowledgments, followed by an intro introduction of our panel and then the main event. Um, thank you to the Honorable Amanda Magdalena reyes Bordeaux, Corey Weber, and Rob Zeister for coming up with the program ideas for tonight, the Historical Society's first ever bankruptcy program. And helping to promote it. I think after this incredible turnout, the Historical Society might want to do more bankruptcy panels, am I right? Um, so I want to give special thanks to Roxana Moradi Brovia, president of the James T. King Bankruptcy and of Court. And of course, the incomparable Robin Lipsky, the executive director of the Historical Society. Thank you so much. And uh, lastly, to my colleague, Jeff Garfinkel, for bringing in the Financial Lawyers Conference as a co-sponsor and MCLE provider. I just want to acknowledge the following organizations who graciously shared this event with their membership, the Central District Consumer Bankruptcy Asso Attorneys Association, CDCBAA, the Central District of California Lawyer Representatives, the Inland Empire Bankruptcy Forum, the Orange County Bankruptcy Forum, Women Lawyers Association of Los Angeles, California Lawyers Association Business Law Section, Insolvency Law Committee. Thanks to the efforts of all these programs, we had an incredible 160 people signed up for this event. And in addition to all of you here, we have about 80 people signed up for virtual, so that's incredible. Uh, one housekeeping item before we begin, there are index cards on the end of the uh, cues, I don't know what else to call them, <laughs> um, and pens. So if anyone has questions, please write them on the cards. We, we need to, we can't have people coming up uh, because of the Zoom. And my friends at the end are going to collect them about 10 minutes before the end of the program and give them to me to ask the panel. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first panel on the history of our illustrious Ninth Circuit Bankruptcy Appellate Panel, the Honorable Gary Spraker, 
was sworn in as Chief Bankruptcy Judge for the District of Alaska on October 4th, 2012. Judge Spraker served as a visiting judge for Nevada since 2013, hearing cases and conducting settlement conferences in both Las Vegas and Reno. He has served as a member of the Ninth Circuit Bankruptcy Appellate Panel since his appointment in 2017. Prior to taking the bench, he was a partner at Christensen and Spraker, where he focused on both consumer and commercial bankruptcy, representing trustees, debtors, and creditors in the Chapter 7, 11, and 13 matters. Judge Spraker served for over a decade as chair of the Alaska Bankruptcy Section. Prior to moving to Alaska, he worked as an associate for Morrison and Forster in Denver, Colorado. Judge Spraker received his undergraduate degree from Stetson University in Dellen, Florida, and his JD from the University of Denver. He is a fellow in the American College of Bankruptcy. Welcome, Judge Spraker. To my immediate right, Susan Sprawl has served as clerk of the Ninth, Bank Ninth Circuit Bankruptcy Appellate Panel since 2009. Prior to joining the BAP, Ms. Sprawl clerked for bankruptcy judges who served on the Eighth and Tenth Circuit BAPs. Prior to joining the judiciary, Ms. Sprawl practiced bankruptcy and law in St. Louis, Missouri for a, a, approximately 10 years with an emphasis on Chapter 11 debtor work. She's a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Law. Welcome, Susan. Yeah. Last but not least, we have Hal Morenas. He's worked for the BAP for over 23 years. He started out as a staff attorney, served for five years as BAP clerk of court, and has done tours of duty as a BAP law clerk to four different BAP judges, including Judges Barry Russell, Bruce Markell, Frank Kurtz, and currently Judge Gary Spraker. Before the BAP, Hal was a finance and bankruptcy practice group attorney at Shepard Mullen for 11 years. Out of law school, he clerked for U.S. Bankruptcy Judge Lisa Hill Finning. He has both undergraduate and law degrees from UCLA Co. Bruins. Welcome, Hal. <laughs> and with that, I am going to turn it over to Susan for a brief overview of the Ninth Circuit BAP. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us in Pasadena. Um, I see myself as the current caretaker of the BAP, so to speak. Um, the Ninth Circuit has the first, the original, the largest, and the best BAP. We started in 1979 with the passing of the code, and what makes this BAP such a success is that it has had the support of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals from day one. It's the only BAP that's been in continuous existence since then, and as I'm probably the only person in the world that has ever actually worked on three BAPs, I can say that with definitive authority. <laughs> um, in the words of the Ninth Circuit, they wanted to start a BAP to provide a convenient and economical forum for the bankruptcy appellate process, to provide a uniform body of quality decisional law for the Ninth Circuit to expedite appeals and to permit, argument, to permit argument in an appellate setting. And we continue to work to uphold that, those principles today. Um, the BAP originally started in 1979 with a panel of five judges. Initially, it was a, it was a pilot project within the judiciary the District of Arizona and the Central District of California were the original participants. Nevada was then added and eventually it was expanded to the circuit and I think we'll get into that a little more detail later. Um, just a few short interesting facts to get us started. We've had 37 judges throughout the history of the BAP from throughout the circuit. One judge has done two tours of duty, Elizabeth Paris. There were originally five judges appointed. That was at one point increased to six, later seven as the caseload grew. But when, as we refer to him as the era player, Sybil Barry Russell left the BAP after his term expired and the caseload was dwindling, that position has never been replaced. So we've been at six judges for a while now, although the circuit officially authorizes up to seven. And with the addition of Judge Rob Ferris in, 20, in 2015 and Judge Spraker in 2017, we now have had a bankruptcy judge from every single district in the circuit serve on the bat. So that's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> and I want to stop there and let these gentlemen get into a little further details. I'm 
I'm not going to steal their thunder, but I'll, I'll pop in later. <laughs> <laughs> Anymore. Uh, so, you've heard what the map is. We're going to dive into some of the history. And as Susan just indicated, this really begins in 78. So, how, why don't you tell us, why do we have a map? Well, first, let's start with the, the 1978 Act. It authorized each judicial council to decide district by district whether they wanted to have panels of three bankruptcy judges or not hear bankruptcy appeals. Before that, um, before the 1978 Act, it was all, all the appeals were heard by district courts with a second level of appeal to the circuit courts of appeal. And as far as, I, th I think the thing that has always been a question for me is how did Congress come up with the idea of a bankruptcy appellate? Well, that's an interesting question, and, and you know, we've done some digging, and, and I, I've certainly done some learning over the past uh, you know, couple of weeks trying to prepare this. But the Bankruptcy Reform Act, as Susan Howe just said, is the creation of the BAP in 1978. You're going to hear a lot about Judge Browning, Chief Judge Browning of the Ninth Circuit, his hands and imprints are all over the BAP and still are. But the BAP didn't really start in 1978, at least it was, didn't just spring out of the sky. There was actually a Ninth uh, Circuit Judicial uh, Conference recommendation back in 1975 to create a, a appellate panel ad hoc of bankruptcy judges to hear cases to alleviate the strain that was going on in the district courts. That that uh, idea, that proposal never gained traction, and it kind of laid there. So how do we actually have, and come up with, with a, a map? How, how did Congress decide to? I think it was like a lot of things in Congress. It was a compromise. Either the House, the original House bill or the original Senate bill had in it a provision for a bankruptcy appellate panel, as I understand it. The House bill provided for Article Three bankruptcy judges with direct appeals to the circuit, and the Senate bill had, the Senate wanted um, bankruptcy appeals heard by the district courts, as it had been in the past, with a, the second level of appeal to the courts of appeal. And to put this in context, 1978 was a watershed time for bankruptcy. Um, prior to that, we had referees. Um, and 1978 Act was a bold step to expand the jurisdiction and power of bankruptcy adjudication. I'm going to get into in a moment what that means. <laughs> it, it, it might have been a bit too bold, but this was part of that reform, and nobody could agree. So, one the House wanted. Uh, the Article Three status, which is a, a significant step up for uh, bankruptcy in general, and the Senate wanted to, to maintain the status quo. At the last moment, there was a compromise struck, and that compromise was the creation of this ad hoc bankruptcy intermediate level of appeal to be staffed by bankruptcy judges. Interestingly, if you read the literature around that time, this was supposed to be, as Susan indicated, a temporary situation. It came up quick. It was agreed to. wasn't necessarily completely thought out. And if you read some of it, actually, uh, bankruptcy judge Lloyd George, who we hear about in just a moment, wrote a, a fascinating article shortly after the, uh, the initiation of the BAP and really criticized the lack of preparation and the ramifications that had at that time and still kind of reverberates through uh, the use of BAPs and what they mean today. But it got passed. George, George, George intimated in the article that, well, this was supposed to be temporary, but there was never any temporary condition placed on it, so it became permanent except that it would remain experimental. So now that we have this ability to have a BAP, what did that mean for the circuits, the district courts, and the bankruptcy judges? Well, here in the first circuit, I mean the ninth circuit, um, very quickly implemented um, the, an order for the appointment, the 
Ninth Circuit Judicial Council issued an order for appointment of one of the authority for the bankruptcy appellate panels under a pilot program. But I just want to emphasize how quick this was. Uh, apparently, the first communication was in March 17, 1979, for um, a discussion amongst the Ninth Circuit judges for uh, whether they wanted to advance with a bankruptcy appellate program along the lines of the 1978 Act. And by September 14, 1979, they had gone through all the steps to vote on establishing a pilot program for a bankruptcy appellate panel in for the Central District of California and the District of Arizona. And that was effective for all cases, bankruptcy cases filed on or after October 1, 1979. So that, that, that shouldn't be overlooked here. The start of the act commenced on October 1st, 1979, creating this whole new panel that was just slotted into the legislation um, that allowed but did not mandate, mandate that circuits could appoint uh, a, a bankruptcy appellate panel by district. And that you've heard now that Arizona and Central California were the, the districts in the Ninth Circuit to start off on this experiment. And it was authorized for one year. But Ninth Circuit under Chief Judge uh, Browning moved with incredible speed because nobody had thought of what structure or form um, this map would physically take. It was, it was headquartered out of the, the courthouse in Los Angeles. Uh, and it's, it, and as Hal said, the Judicial Council for the Ninth Circuit approved the BAP on September 14, 1979. It went effective October 1, 1979. It heard its, uh, it received its first case February 1, 1980. And it, it uh, decided its first case, Weimer v. Weimer, in April of 1980. So that just happened quickly. And some things, I think, got lost in the quickness with which they implemented this. For instance, there was no rule in the circuit order that prevented that judges from hearing appeals from their own bankruptcy district. They, they did prohibit you hearing your own cases. <laughs> but, but you could hear your colleagues. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the BAP, as a matter of practice, they didn't want to hear the, the uh, appeals from their colleagues. So they quickly came up with a, just a internal practice rule they would not sit on their colleagues' bankruptcy appeals from their, own, from their own districts. The other thing that gets overlooked, and I was kind of stunned when I, I did not realize, and maybe it was just my own night day, is when this was adopted, all appeals in a district with a BAP went to the BAP. Again, it was a bold act in 1978. Um, but we should take a moment. So in, 19, in September 1979, five judges were appointed. Uh, from Arizona, Judge Davis from Nevada, uh, ju uh, Judge George, as I just mentioned, from Northern California, and Judge Hughes, um, from Southern California, Judge Katz, and from Central California, Judge Lazaro. Now, interestingly, th these judges um, ended up spending about two to four years on the BAP at that time. Obviously, the one year got extended. Uh, the Nevada came on, the rest of the California co courts came on after a year. And things started picking up. But the interesting thing is those judges that replaced the first five, including Judge Folan, Judge Elliott, Judge Abrams, Judge Ashland, and Judge Pyle, stayed a little longer. Judge Volan stayed for 17 years. <laughs> judge Ashland remained a judge on the map for 15 years. Because another thing they didn't put in the original order was a ter end of term date for the judges appointed to the BAP. We, we should take that as an opportune time. That's not the case right now. Uh, we, we, we won't be staying 15 years. Currently, we are appointed for a seven-year term with an opportunity, if we want, to um, ask for an additional three years. So the maximum now is 10 years. And I think another important thing to note is that in this very early phase, as the bankruptcy appellate panel went from a pilot program in two districts, within a very short period of time, within two years, it was all the districts. Its caseload exploded from 60, 56 appeals in 1980 to 615 appeals in 1982. And it 
and for a new baby court to have to handle all those appeals from scratch, have to come up with procedures, it's just an amazing accomplishment. It really is unique as to what happened. Um, you know, other circuits did consider BAPs mainly on a district by district basis. There's at a, this early point, it was only the first circuit. Only the first circuit was the. They the dabbled point. in BAPs and they, we'll get into it in a little bit, so they, they disbanded their BAP in 1982 as a result of that. And so the only other ones I could define that really could seriously consider is the Fifth Circuit considered a BAP for Texas and Florida, but found that there was really no, no benefit to it. And the Seventh Circuit had, uh, for a while, considered panels, um, but also declined to do so. You know, as far as the unique experience in that, in a later report to Congress, the Ninth Circuit explained its reasoning for establishing bankruptcy appellate panel. And the reasons it gave Congress were providing a convenient and economical forum for bankruptcy appeals, expediting bankruptcy appeals, permitting argument in an appellate setting, and most importantly, is the building a uniform body of quality bankruptcy decision law. Now, these obviously were the official reasons, but from all I've read and learned, I suspect that there were two additional practical reasons. First were the, at least some districts in the Ninth Circuit were suffering from just crushing district court caseloads, and they did not want the bankruptcy appeals on top of that. The district courts didn't want the Ninth Circuit wanted to find an alternative. And, you know, the second, you know, practical reason was Judge J James Browning's quest for judicial innovation in the circuit and to combat those who already were saying that the Ninth Circuit was too large and were seeking to have it split. So he, uh, this was only one of several innovations that Judge Browning over the course of his 12-year tenure as a chief circuit judge implemented. And former Supreme Court Chief Justice William Rehmquist once said that, that the formation of the BAP uh, was just one of these major implement, implementations that Judge Browning accomplished for the sake of the improvement of the fair and efficient administration of justice. So we're, we're off. We have a BAP. It's running. It's expanding. Things are looking good. There's lots of cases being filed. Life is good in 1982 until and then in 1982, the Supreme Court decided, oh, by the way, the bankruptcy system is unconstitutional. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that had some, <laughs> had some ramifications. Uh, Supreme Court understood what it was doing, stayed the effect of its decision to give Congress the opportunity to alter the constitutional defects and set a deadline. It wasn't met. It was extended until Christmas Eve 1982, and it still wasn't met. And so we go into effect with a, with a, a um, constitutionally infirm bankruptcy system. What did that mean for the BAPs? <laughs> Well, it, for the two BAPs in the country at the time, the First Circuit BAP held a, uh, had an appeal where the, the very issue was the constitutionally of the BAP post-marathon. They said, the, the, the First Circuit BAP itself said, we're unconstitutional. I guess they turned off the lights and closed the doors. And, uh, the, the First Circuit Court of Appeals ended up ruling on a different ground in that case, but that was it for the First Circuit BAP. At that time, the response here in the Ninth Circuit was um, far different. The Ninth Circuit Judicial Council issued an, an order, a new order, uh, still permitting the BAP to hear cases, pre-marathon cases, meaning that they were the, the bankruptcy, the appeal was filed before the mandate went effective in December 24, 1982. So, it, it, again, it was signed by Chief Judge Browning. It was actually attached in the reported decision from the from the First Circuit. That's where you find it these days. But it, it's a pretty innovative and bold move, again, signed by Chief Judge Browning, that said we're going to continue presaging what will happen shortly thereafter. Um, 
the Ninth Circuit in a, a case called Bernie that examined the constitutionality of the PAP and presaging what was going to happen said, well, really, this is nothing more than an adjunct or a division of the circuit court. We have full control over it. Your concerns of marathon don't apply to this. Um, we don't have to deal with, with you know, findings of fact. We do nothing but de novo review from the, the BAP. So it's found the BAP constitutional and continued. And I love the little tweak in that they extended the ability of the BAP to consider any case that was filed before the end of the extension, notwithstanding the Supreme Court's ruling that the matter was unconstitutional. So the Ninth Circuit was truly continuing to try to push the bounds of, of the employment and continuation of the BAP. I mean, well, there's another example of that. The, uh, the last districts to come online as part of the bankruptcy appellate panel actually occurred in November of 1982 after Marathon. And, and just to continue on in that experiment and expand it in that immediate post-Marathon environment is just really a testament to Judge Browning's commitment and the Ninth Circuit's did and the district's commitment to continuing the battle. Yeah, I was going to add, yes, that November 30th, 1982 order also said, and we're expanding it to all districts in the circuit. So, yes, we are here and we're growing. Effective tomorrow, December 1st. Well, the First Circuit then decided that that was the end of its path and that continued um, eventually, Congress did uh, adopt the 1984 Act to address the constitutional infirmities. And as part of that, it continued the option or the available option for the circuits to, to have the, the BAPs. So what happens after 1984? Well, you have uh, the back bankruptcy amendments and the Federal Judgeship Act, which completely revamped, as, as you all know, bankruptcy jurisdiction and the authority of bankruptcy judges to hear bankruptcy cases. It also revamped how uh, the, BAP, the BAP's authority and the focus. There were three new features of bankruptcy appellate jurisdiction. And the three new features were litigant consent. Most importantly, if the litigants didn't consent, it had to go to the district court. The second feature, which arguably might be more important, is district court referral. It's just that here in the Ninth Circuit, it wasn't as much of a factor. I still feel the guiding hand of Judge Browning that every single district in the circuit, more or less lockstep, issued a general order automatically referring their bankruptcy appeals uh, to the BAP subject to uh, litigant consent. And then the third new feature, it's just, it's really Byzantine because you now have a two-track initial bankruptcy appeal uh, track where you have some appeals going to the bank of the BAP, some appeals going to the district court, and then the you know, second level appeal from both into the court of appeals. And so this was all a result of marathon. So again, these are some of the consequences and, and, and continuation. Now you have um, two level, ex an existing two level intermediate court there's still questions regarding what the authority of whom over whom may be. That's never been addressed statutorily. That's still an open question in, in, in much of the country. Um, the BAP in 1987 issued a decision called Windmill Farms, which said that BAP decisions are binding on all the bankruptcy courts in the circuit. But then in 1990, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals says, well, um, yeah, you know, we're not going to rule on that exactly, but don't don't quote that as good law. And to this day, I don't know if the Ninth Circuit has ever said that. The, well, the, the concern is that, and the concern raised in, in the Bank of Maui was you can't have an Article Three court, the district courts, bound by the bankruptcy appellate panels' decisions. So there was this tension, and well. The Ninth Circuit made it very clear that they consider the BAP's decisions persuasive authority at, at the circuit level. They, they never really said who they're binding on. So that's one of the legacies of Marathon is that we don't use that we're only persuasive authority in the circuit. 
So another legacy of Marathon was the death knell of the first circuit. <laughs> they just decided it wasn't worth it. Um, but that did not necessarily go unnoticed. And in 1994, uh, again, some would say possibly at the urging uh, of uh, Judge Browning or, or his legacy, um, prior to that, Chief Judge Justice Rehnquist uh, then appointed a federal court study to examine the structure and operation of the, of the judicial system. And one of the key results that came out of it was a recommendation that Congress require all circuits to establish bankruptcy appellate panels. They didn't go quite so far, but in 1994, in the revised Bankruptcy Act, Congress enacted what is currently um, found at 28 U.S.C. 158. It made the creation of an of a appellate panel mandatory unless the Judicial Council of that circuit found that there was either insufficient judicial resources to support it or made a finding of the establishment of such service would result in undue delay or increased cost. But did that have any, any effect? Uh, well, I think some some circuits did come up with bankruptcy appellate panels, but most did not. And I think some, you said, I think you indicated some didn't even respond. That's true. The part of the, the teeth in this is that if you chose not to, you had to file the circuit. Was, was required to file a, uh, a factual basis of his finding to the Judicial Conference in the United States. And one uh, law review that, that I read that as, in 90, as of November of 1995, only eight of the circuits respond. Several of them just never even uh, responded and gave any findings. Um, but several uh, of the circuits did uh, respond and, and file uh, or did enact um, the, the BAPs that we have today, some have lasted, some have not. Susan, was the Second Circuit have a BAP for a while? I was going to say, the fir today, the First Circuit, the Sixth, Eighth, Ninth, and Tenth have BAPs. The Second Circuit had a BAP, but the Southern District of New York never opted into it, so it was a very small BAP, and it disbanded for that reason. Uh, the Tenth Circuit, for a while, did not include Colorado, even though that's where the circuit headquarters is. They now have all of their, um, all jurisdictions in that BAP. The Eighth Circuit BAP, it's been since I moved out here in 2009 that South Dakota joined. So it is now unanimous, but it, it operated with all but one state for a while. And is there maybe a jurisdiction in the Sixth Circuit that isn't in there, but the, which does make the Ninth Circuit unique and that Judge Browning really did get the ball moving quickly and have every single district participate. So I think that's going to bring us up to date, uh, at least for the history of it. We want to cover a few other areas, though. Yes, Susan. So can we talk procedure a little bit? Uh, one, talk about um, bankruptcy judges sitting by designation. That was one of my favorite things about being a clerk when I clerked for Judge Niner. Um, we sat by designation for the BAP, and uh, it was a great experience and the only all-nighter I pulled as a clerk. So, um, Susan, can you tell us a little about by city, sitting by designation? Sure. The BAP is authorized to have bankruptcy judges sit by designation on an individual panel, typically the assignment. Uh, the Circuit Judicial Council will literally assign a judge to BAP service for a setting. We, we do that for several reasons. One, and not currently a factor, workload. Um, two, to give all of the bankruptcy judges an opportunity to sit on the BAP. I think it's an invaluable tool for a bankruptcy judge to get to Monday, you know, morning quarterback their day job. It, it makes you a better judge because it puts you in a, in a completely different viewpoint looking at your your day-to-day -day job. And there is at least one judge in this room who's relatively new and is not yet sat with the BAP, but who will be getting an, an opportunity <laughs> to sit with us, judge. <laughs> um, so we, we do it as a learning opportunity for the judges, and uh, most of them really enjoy it. Can we talk a little about procedure with Susan while we're on it? Absolutely. Okay. So how are appeals filed with the Ninth Circuit BAP, and uh, what's the average timeline? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a few quick stats. Um, they, they're... 
um, you know, you file your notice of appeal at the bankruptcy court. If you don't check the box that says, I want to go to the district court, you come to the BAP. That's an interesting little tidbit because in 2015, there's a new, since 2015, there's a new form where you just check the box that I want to go to the district court. Before that, you had to, the appellant had to file a separate statement of election on the same date. Um, I thought that change would make it a lot easier for pro se parties to find the district court by checking that box. Interestingly, that has not been the case. Um, it's made it easier for attorneys to check that box, but not pro se's because we've had a very high pro se filing rate since that change went into effect. Um, basically, our filings have fluctuated with bankruptcy cases over the year. We're at a pretty low point right now. We had 200 cases filed with us last year. During my tenure, we've been as high as 750. Um, the average timeline, we're getting about, I think it's about 8.2 months. We've really, where we've seen a um, in noticeable increase in, in speeding up the timeline with the advent of Zoom. There's pluses and minuses, but the BAP used to travel to each location, and I would hold cases till I had, you know, a few cases to go to Arizona, to go to Las Vegas, to go here and there. So we might hold, and it, this is not as much of an impact on the Central District of California because it's been our highest caseload and we have a steady diet. But say we go to Arizona twice a year. Well, if your appeal is fully brief, you know, the week after we were in Arizona, you might have to wait six months, we're getting things set as, as soon as we're briefing them. So that, that we're, we're at about 8.2 months from filing to decision, and you get your brief set, you get your briefs in, we're going to set you for a hearing, and you will get oral argument. Um, I, I, I always get asked, what's the, you know, district court versus BAP rate. Again, that's varied over the years. For the period from, you know, 2000 through today, it's typically somewhere between 40 to 60 max, 50-50. Prior to the 2015 check the box, the BAP tended to be in the 50 to 60 range and the district court tended to be in the 40 to 50 range. Since the 2015 check the box form, it's skewed the other way with the BAP getting more of the 40 to 50 percent and the district court getting the 50 to 60 percent. And if you ask me why, I think that's why. Um, reversal rate, that's another question I always get. If you think of an appeal, it's, it's hard. You've got to show there was error. You've got to show an abuse of discretion. So it's, it's generally an uphill battle, but I, I, I went through 2003 to 2023, looked at the, and I'm going with the percentage of cases where the BAP either reversed or remanded, because I consider that a win for the appellant. The bankruptcy judges don't consider a remand a good thing at all, but I'm just saying from the appellant's perspective here, um, and it has ranged from a low of 8.7% to a high of 32%. Um, with an, I, my average is about 18.6, and I'd say more than half of them of, of the years, it's greater than 20% chance of getting relief. So that's that's a pretty good pretty good odds for for taking an appeal. So those are just some interesting things and things that I regularly get asked. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to reveal some poll results. So thank you to my end of court friends for helping me with this. Um, we wanted to know uh, why do you have one a rule of thumb about BAP versus district court um, and why? So mo the most popular answer, typical lawyers, was depends on the case. So um, I got a response that says, if I won, I want district court because I would rather have one judge and his or her couple law clerks, then three bankruptcy judges and all their law clerks taking apart that decision. 
Um, I have another one here. It says, while the statistics don't prove my theory to be accurate, if it is a matter I believe the district court will defer to the bankruptcy judge's expertise on a purely bankruptcy issue, I choose to go to the district court. The thought is that the BAP may focus on some super technical bankruptcy geeky issue and remand or overrule the decision. <laughs> um, this one's better. I would prefer to remain at the BAP for all appeals, both as appellant and appellee. I find their filing system is user-friendly, and its procedures and rules are consistent and uniform, not individualized for any particular district court judge. That isn't to say that any particular district court judge doesn't know his or her stuff. Surprisingly, I've been impressed with their decision and reasoning. It just makes me nervous they may not get the real-life practices and practical that bankruptcy judges deal with on the day-to-day. Um, and then I says, this person says, I think the bankruptcy court is probably correct, and the appellant, if I think the bankruptcy court is probably correct, I, and I'm the appellant, I will choose district court and focus on non-bankruptcy issues, such as procedural or due process defects. But if I'm the appellee, and the decision was probably correct, then I will choose the BAP, because the three-judge panel knows bankruptcy law better than district court judges. If the client wants to save on attorney's fees, we may go to district court, because often there is no oral argument. If we don't need a state pending appeal, but the appeal itself will, stay, will stall plan confirmation, we will choose district court to give us more time. Uh, pretty much always choose the BAP if it involves bankruptcy issues. If it is, issues involving state or federal law will consider the district court. Um, generally, if the issue is purely bankruptcy related and the facts are on my client's side, and especially if we are the appellants, I will generally defer to the BAP as they simply have more knowledge of bankruptcy laws. However, if it's a real slam dunk and we are appellees, I may choose district court as their decisions are more presidential. And then I would rather go to the BAP no matter what. They know bankruptcy law and generally make the correct decision. Plus, the process is so much faster than district court. Those are my straw polls. I only, I only have one comment. The, the person that said they want to save the money involved with, no, with oral argument, you can always waive oral argument at the BAP. We do not make you come to oral argument. We give you the opportunity. So I just wanted to make sure everyone is aware of that. So we have about five minutes left. Did we have questions? Did anyone even write questions on their cards? Uh, okay. Uh, you can't be heard on Zoom, but I think we can hear you. That's a great question about how bankruptcy judges become BAP judges. Judge Breaker, since you've been through that process. I've been through that process three times. <laughs> um, so it, it, it is an application. The notice goes out that there's a vacancy, and whoever is sitting a judge within the circuit may apply. There is no actual limitation that you must be on the, uh, on, you know, the bench for X amount of time. Um, it's an application, several writing samples, they get in, and then generally, you know, they pick, uh, they being a committee formed of three um, circuit judges and two bankruptcy judges, the bankruptcy judges being the chief uh, uh, judge of the BAP and the circuit chief of bankruptcy court, um, will then interview the applicant and choose the applicant. We totally skipped over it. Who's on the BAP? Who is on the map? If I call your name, please stand. <laughs> we are fortunate to have them all present here tonight. We have current Chief uh, Judge Bill Lafferty from the Northern District of California. <laughs> we have Judge Rob Ferris from the District of Hawaii. Somewhere, I believe we have Judge Julie Brown from Central. Oh, she just stepped, stepped out. out. Yeah. All right. We have Judge Scott Gann from Arizona. And Judge Frank, Judge Frank Corbett from Eastern District of Washington. Thank you so much. Uh, question from Judge Bluebond. Yes, you just have to go through the BAP for the districts that had the, the BAP. Uh, any other questions? No question. No one wrote questions either? Okay, well, with that, I'm just I'm going to thank the panel unless you have anything. Well, I, I, I want to say, and I think I speak for most of my colleagues on the BAP, if not all of them, it truly is an honor to 
have what is such a unique opportunity to be both a trial judge and an appellate judge at the same time. That is a mind-blowing situation, right? And the one thing that I can tell you is that it, it works in the favor of the system, I believe, because we do we never go into a hearing, to a conference, leaving our day job. So a lot of us have a, therefore, the, the grace of God go us, and we realize what is going on in the underlying case that we're seeing, all right? And it is fascinating to see the differences throughout the districts, but it is truly an honor to be both a bankruptcy judge and a BAP judge. So thank you very much for coming. Oh, and, and I want to thank one person who isn't here. Kathy Catterson was very instrumental in the initial development of the BAP. And at one point during my tenure, she's even referred to it as Susan, the BAP is my baby, and I'm going to fight to save it. So thanks go out to Kathy Catterson, too, for us existing as an institution. We're going to take a one-minute stretch break, and if the next panel can come up, that would be great. Thank you so much. All right, let's go ahead and get started with the uh, second round here today. So let me start with introductions. First of all, my name is Dan Collins. I'm a bankruptcy judge in the District of Arizona. To my left, everybody knows uh, Judge uh, Sherry Lubon from the Central District of California. Was our clap? <laughs> and to my right uh, is a partner from the book holder law firm, uh, Jeff Garfinkel. Jeff is very involved in healthcare and pharmaceutical bankruptcies. Uh, he clerked for the San Diego judge, uh, Louise Adler, along the way. I uh, was married, or is married, to somebody who clerked for Judge Meyer in Tucson, first year in, uh, in San Diego. And so, uh, here's here's what we'd like to do. First of all, today's about history. We understand that, and so we're going to try to have a little bit of historical uh, time. Uh, but we also we're hearing about the map today, and so what we're going to do is formulate a discussion about how we can make it even more interesting to be a BAP judge uh, when you review jury trials. And so today we're going to be talking about jury trials in bankruptcy. So I got appointed back in 2013, and when I was walked around the, the court building in Phoenix, we have uh, seven courtrooms, and only two of them had jury boxes. And I said to the, the judge that I replaced, Chuck Case, I said, how many jury trials have we actually had in the District of Arizona? He said, Absolutely zero. It's never happened. Never happened at all. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I wonder why that is. And then I just didn't think about it. When well, I get to baby judges school, uh, Judge Blubon, all the judges in the room had gone to baby judges school back in D.C. And it turns out that some of my colleagues had actually tried cases in the bankruptcy court as lawyers. So it's always been in the back of my mind, what does it really take to get a jury trial going in bankruptcy court? So um, about, I would say, nine months ago or so, on a Friday, in an onward and upward session, Judge uh, Lafferty was very instrumental in getting these going. It's judge discussions among judges uh, on a Zoom call, and, and one of the topics one time was jury trials and bankruptcy. And so they had an entire session on that. I thought it was fascinating. And, uh, and so I thought, you know, someday I want to write a little article about that. Well, the, the opportunity presented itself shortly after that because... The Ninth Circuit has a number of different committees, and I got appointed as the first bankruptcy judge in something that used to be called the Jury Trial Improvement Committee. Well, now it's just the Trial Improvement Committee, and so I wrote an article about jury trials and bankruptcy. And so if you look at the materials, Caroline, how the materials going out to everybody? So we have an, a really excellent uh, PowerPoint presentation in that uh, set of materials done by Jeff and, and his uh, partners. But at the back of that is this article that went out to the Trial Improvement Committee. So it's something I'm really interested in. Luckily, today, we have somebody who actually has tried a jury trial in bankruptcy court, and that's Jeff, and so we're going to hear from Jeff. But before then, we're going to hear from Judge Blue Bond. And why did I call her? Well, she's smart. She's entertaining. And she'll draw a crowd wherever she goes. And so that was just, she was a natural. So it's, it's really my pleasure to have Judge Blubon. First of all, walk us through how one goes about getting a jury trial. Judge Blubon? Sure. 
All right, well, I, I feel like uh, Julie Andrews in the sound of music because I'm going to say let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. But we're not talking about ABC or Doremi. We're going to start with the Seventh Amendment, which says, in suits of common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, I think that's most of our cases, the right of a jury, trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise reexamined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. So, okay, if you had a right to jury trial outside of bank, Bankruptcy, you shouldn't lose it just because you're in bankruptcy, right? Well, not exactly. But let's start with the first half of that. So how do you know if you have a right to a jury trial in the first place? That's simple. The Supreme Court explained it in Grand Financiera versus Norberg in 1989, 492 U.S. 33. You just ask yourself whether the claim to be litigated is the same or analogous to the one that would have been brought in a court of law as opposed to a court of equity or admiralty if it had been brought in England in the late 18th century before the courts of law and equity were merged, and more importantly, whether the remedy sought is legal or equitable in nature. So easy, right? So yeah, okay. So let's assume you've gotten over that first hurdle and there is or was a right to a jury trial. And remember, you may be deemed to have waived it if you're the one who filed bankruptcy in the first place, or if you're a creditor and you decided to file a proof of claim. But in any event, let's assume you have a right to a jury trial that hasn't been waived. Can the bankruptcy court conduct that jury trial? So let's recall also that the font of all bankruptcy jurisdiction is 28 U.S.C. 1334, and the jurisdiction actually resides in the district court, but Section 157 of Title 28 authorizes the district court to refer that jurisdiction to the bankruptcy court. And 157E says that if there is a right to a jury trial, the bankruptcy judge may conduct the jury trial if, if, one, the judge has been specially designated by the district court to conduct a jury trial, and two, has the express consent of all of the parties to the conduct of the jury trial. And notice that Section 157 doesn't say anything about core or non-core. That isn't really the issue. The requirements are the same whether the matter is core or non-core, although maybe it's less likely there would be a right to a jury trial in most core matters, but think back to Grand Financiera. There is a right to a jury trial in preference of fraudulent trans, uh, transfer actions, even though they're core. And then um, in Stern v. Marshall type matters that are statutorily core, I guess you could actually, and it would be unconstitutional have a bankruptcy judge enter a final order, you could maybe have a right to jury trial in one of those kind of matters too. So Federal Rule of Bankruptcy Procedure 9015, all of this is discussed in your PowerPoint, by the way, at great length, as well as amendments to these things over time. Federal Rule of Bankruptcy Procedure 9015 15 also gives us some guidance in this area. Federal Rule of Bankruptcy Procedure 9015 makes portions of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure that talk about jury trials applicable in bankruptcy cases, and it tells us that the parties may consent to have a bankruptcy court conduct a jury trial. They have to do it either in a joint writing or they can each file a separate writing uh, within whatever time limits are specified in the local rules. So you've got to look to the local rules for time limits if the right to jury trial exists and the bankruptcy court has been specially designated by the district court to conduct the jury trial, and the party with the right to a jury trial didn't blow the time limits, made a timely demand thereto in accordance with FRCP 38B. Okay. So all the district courts in the country took Congress up on its invitation to refer their bankruptcy jurisdiction to the bankruptcy courts in their jurisdiction and what we call a general order of reference. But what about this special designation stuff? Rather than discuss what all the general orders of reference in the district throughout the circuit say, it's in the materials, um, but I'm just going to talk about the Central District of California. Um, but a special thank you to also, uh, not only to Jeff and his partner, but Eric Diaz at Buck Halter also for putting all those materials together. So he actually went district by district. Oh, there you are. Hi. He went district by district and tells us what everybody's local rules say on that and the general orders of reference and all that. Okay. In the Central District, our general order of reference, the latest version of which is District General Order 1305, not only refers to the district court's bankruptcy jurisdiction under, not only refers the bankruptcy jurisdiction to the bankruptcy court under 1334, but it also specially designates us to conduct jury trials with the express consent of the parties. So what does specially designate actually mean? Is it any different from expressly designate? I have no idea. But what it does mean is that any general order that's trying to authorize bankruptcy judges to conduct jury trials really needs to use those magic words or we could have trouble. So I, guess I haven't checked, but I'm guessing that every general order of reference that's trying to do that says specially designate. I don't know. Does that really, I mean, does that work? For, I, I, anyway. Okay. In 
addition, I think it's helpful to avoid, it, also in our, in our general order of reference, which I think is really helpful, there's a provision that says if the parties consent to a jury trial in a proceeding before a bankruptcy judge, they will be deemed to have consented to the entry of a final order by the bankruptcy judge in that proceeding. I think that's helpful because one of the things that was always hard to get our brain around is how could you have a jury trial in a case that was only related where it had to go for a final order to the district court? Because then you'd have like an advisory jury, which there is such a thing and it's okay to have that, but do we want that? And isn't that maybe a violation of the Seventh Amendment where you'd have somebody, a judge, re-examining? I don't know. Anyway, that we don't have that problem in the Central District because if you consent to a jury trial, you will be deemed to have consented to the entry of final orders. And then there's one really uh, more really helpful item in our general order, one that authorizes the bankruptcy judge to whom a case is assigned to transfer the case or proceeding to the district court if the bankruptcy judge concludes that the proceeding should be heard in district court. So we can actually send it to the district court. Now, for example, if we know that a matter has to be tried by a jury um, because the parties haven't consented to let us do it, we don't have to wait for somebody to move the district court to withdraw the reference. We could send it over ourselves if we're so inclined. And then we also have a local bankruptcy rule 9015-1, which gives you even more information about how to do a jury trial. Um, it tells us that you have to have six members on your jury, and it gives you information about procedures for submitting jury instructions, objecting to jury instructions, special verdicts and interrogatories for juries, and making a demand for a jury trial. And then we've got 9015-2, which tells you that once you make a demand for a jury trial, it can't be withdrawn without the consent of the parties, and that a failure to make a timely demand in the proper manner constitutes a waiver of a trial by jury. But the bankruptcy court, that's own initiative, can still refer things out uh, for a jury trial. LBR 9015-2 also, also authorizes the bankruptcy court on its own initiative to try an issue with an advisory jury or with the consent of the parties to order a trial with a jury whose verdict has the same effect as if someone had a right to a jury trial. So I guess if the bankruptcy judge wanted to and the parties agreed, you could even try something to a jury if you didn't have a right to a jury trial. I don't know why you'd ever want to do that, but okay. There is an exception, though. If the U.S. is a party and there's a statute that provides for a trial without a jury, you can't, you can't do it with the jury. And then there's some timing rules in 9015-2, one that comes up a fair amount. Even if there's a right to jury trial that's been preserved by a timely demand, 9015-2G says the bankruptcy court's going to handle all the proceedings up through and including approval and entry of the pretrial order. You can move the district court to withdraw the reference because you have a right to jury trial, but they often won't grant it until it's after the pretrial. And then 9015-2 also tells you that if you want to bring a motion to withdraw the reference so the district court can conduct a jury trial, you have to file the motion within seven days after the entry of the pretrial order, or you'll be deemed to have consented to have the bankruptcy court conduct the jury trial. And then one last point to remember, um, people saw that I was doing this panel and said, oh, have you done a jury trial? No. I haven't. Um, there have only been, I think, two or three in our entire district in like 40 years, okay? So if we do decide, or I guess I used to have nightmares, a couple of my friends would like consent to like have me do a jury trial. If you decide to do that, and I am not asking for that, um, if you decide to do one, you need to know that we don't know what we're doing. Um, so we will have to recruit somebody from the district court or clerk to train our courtroom deputy as to what to do. And then the district court's the one who has to impanel the jury. So it, it, imagine there will be a bit more lead time between your pretrial conference and your trial date while we figure out what we're doing. So you need to be able to give us a little extra time and be a little patient with us. Thank you. So, Jeff Lubbock, one of the things that, uh, that I did before uh, getting ready for this, uh, this event today, I sent an email to all of the uh, bankruptcy court chief judges in all of the uh, uh, districts in the circuit. And the response was, yeah, I've never heard of anybody doing one. I don't know anybody that did one. Uh, but we did learn that Judge Sive, uh, married to Susan Sproul, uh, did a jury trial uh, up in Reno. And uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here to be with us today. Uh, but Judge Mon did one, too, and I talked to her about Judge it. Judge Mon, uh, yes. Um, so I'm going to ask Judge Blue about a couple different questions and then think about questions yourself, because at the end, I'm going to reserve a little bit of time for that. But let me ask you this, Judge Blue Bond. You've talked about the gigantic stack of rules uh, pertinent in the Central District of, of California. You guys lead the nation in rules by far. Now, <laughs> one of my colleagues in, uh, in Western District of Wisconsin is proud to announce to everybody that they have three local rules in the entire district, but you guys uh, have gone way beyond that. Um, we also have a court manual that elaborates on things that aren't filled out quite enough. And, the, uh, and so consult the rules. You'll, you'll uh, be able to figure it out if you just read the rules. But here's my question, more of a practical matter. Why do people not 
consent, in your view? Because consent is really the hallmark or the, the starting point uh, to getting both sides consenting to the jury trial in the bankruptcy court. Why do you think that doesn't really happen that often? Well, for one thing, all the cases settle and don't go to trial anyway. Um, so you often don't really get to that. Um, and I think that, that generally bankruptcy lawyers are terrified of the prospect of doing a jury trial, period. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, if they had to do one, they'd probably rather do it in a court they're comfortable with. Although the prospect, as close as I came one time, there were parties who were talking about consenting at the pre-trial conference, and I said, well, okay, that's exciting, but you have to make it some extra time because I've never done one, and I don't know how to do it, but I'll figure it out, and I don't have to worry. They changed their minds and decided not to consent, <laughs> which was kind of what I had in mind. But anyway... Um, so, in bankruptcy, that people will preserve a right to jury trial, I think, largely for their interorum effect that it has an opposing counsel. I think, you know, if you're litigating a preference action and the defendant has refused to waive the right to jury trial, come on, fess up. You're going to settle that more cheaply than you would if they weren't saying on that we're going to do jury trial. It, not only, even, even if it isn't just fear, it's going to cost you a lot more money and you don't get to recover your attorney's fees. So, of course, you're going to settle. So, people, I, I, the, I, the cases don't even get, I, I think I've had... I've been on the bench, uh, February 1 was 22 years, I think, um, no, 23 years. Um, I've only had, I think, one or two cases where people even preserved their right to jury trial and wanted to go to district court where I sent it over. So people aren't even preserving their right to jury trial in the first place, or maybe they don't even know if they have one. So I, 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 your question kind of never comes up. So I look around the room and I don't really see a lot of scared people. I think I see people a little bit feel like the gauntlet was just thrown back. Right, well, let's raise it. How many people think it'd be fun to do a jury trial? Okay. Yeah, look at that. All right. We got some yeah, you're lawyers right. out okay. there. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, but that actually wasn't the right question. How many of you would actually do it, though? I mean, it might have been right. Okay. Stop. Okay. Okay. I, I see that. All right. So now we're going to turn to the guy who actually... If you were going to do it, would you rather have me do it, or would you rather have a judge that knows how to do it do it? How many would rather have me do it? Oh, okay. you're, just, you're just pandering. You're just pandering. Right, yeah. Well, let me just ask you directly, do you want to do one? No. <laughs> I feel just I don't if you make me. I just, I don't want to I would to love it. to do it and just let the bat play with that one. Uh, reversible error. <laughs> All right. So, just let's turn to you, because you actually have been there, and it wasn't just a, a you know, uh, trying to throw fear in your opponent's uh, uh, game. Um, you actually got there, but it's kind of interesting procedurally how it got there. So I'd like you to walk a little bit through what was going on in that case. If you go to page 33 of the, of the slides, uh, that's where it begins in, in this story. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Jeff. First, uh, thank you for inviting me on the panel. Uh, I'd be remiss, since we're here on the BAP, not to give acknowledgement to my wife, Deborah, who was a BAP clerk for nine, almost nine years for Jim Myers. Um, and I, but for the existence of the BAP, I wouldn't have had the last 33 years of marital bliss in, in our lives together without the BAP. So I, I owe the BAP a lot for uh, my life um, and how it turned out. Uh, but um, in, in November of 1990, I was a law clerk for uh, Louise Adler, um, then Louise Malugin. Um Enjoy her divorce as a law clerk. <laughs> 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 um, but a debtor, a auto finance company, filed bankruptcy in front of uh, John Ryan in Santa Ana called Title Acceptance Court. Um, by the time I had joined my old firm, um, there had been a year of fighting over cash collateral and lender liability lawsuits filed um, by litigation counsel, and that was in the heyday of lender liability lawsuit. My firm represented Security Pacific Credit Corp, which ultimately got uh, bought out by Bank of America. Um, so when I joined, there was a lawsuit, um, uh, and an answer had been filed by Security Pacific. Security Pacific agreed that the matter was not core, and this was lender liability, fraud, negligence, all the, the panoply of, of lender misconduct. In its answer, it, it clearly said it didn't consent to the bankruptcy court's entry of a final judgment, and it requested a jury trial. October of 1991, I joined my old firm, um, and the first thing I worked on was filing a lawsuit against the guarantors uh, for a state court lawsuit 
uh, by the Security Pacific, whereupon the debtors, uh, the debtors removed the guarantee lawsuit, at which point Judge Ryan, over our objection, consolidated the guarantee lawsuit with the, uh, the pending lender liability lawsuit. So that's how we are now into the bankruptcy court on a consolidated cross complaints. Um, and we're still fighting over cash collateral. This is an auto finance company that is now in bankruptcy for a year and a half. Um, in June of 1992, we have a long evidentiary hearing, the conclusion of which is Judge Ryan issues a very lengthy findings of fact, finding that the principal of the debtor was a liar. And seven, eight pages of very detailed everything he had done and misrepresented the court, and the court converts the case to Chapter 7. But up to that point, your client was dead set on having A, a jury trial, and B, anywhere but bankruptcy court. Absolutely, because, you know, a year and a half of cash collateral usage fights and witnessing a, a judge maybe somewhat debtor-friendly, but the fear of uh, having the bankruptcy court rule on that. So the Chapter 7 trustee comes in, he looks at the lawsuit. So I think it was a he. I, by the way, I might, you know, no one can check me because the dockets uh, don't exist in this case. And, the, and the, for some reason, the records have all been destroyed. So I, I, no one can actually fact check me, but, I, but we've gotten some confirmation on some of these facts. Um, but he, the Chapter 7 trustee says, I'm going to go forward with this lawsuit. At which point, Security Pacific Bank says, we want this bankruptcy judge to try the lawsuit. Yeah, the one who's already found the two witnesses is, is a lying scumbag. Yeah, we love that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, of course, the Chapter 7 trustee comes in and says, no, judge, we don't want you to do the lawsuit, and we object to your jurisdiction. To which point the judge uh, said, no, you're deemed to have consented because you're stepping into the shoes of the debtor. And... Uh, and I'm going to conduct the jury trial after I convinced the judge, Ryan, that we had a hearing. What do we want to do now? He had denied, partially granted a denied summary judgment. He said, what do you want to do now, counsel? And we said, judge, we want you to try this case. And he looks at us and says, like, Ted Lubon, really? <laughs> <laughs> you really want this? And we said, yes, your honor. And uh, for those that know Judge Ryan, he was not one to be timid. He was like, okay, I'll do it. And uh, we then proceeded in uh, February of 1994 to have a five, I think it was a four or five day jury trial. We had a six person jury. Uh, it was supervised by the, the district court, as I recall. And ultimately there were, I think, almost two dozen motions in limine. One of my uh, co-counsel uh, still has the motion limine book. Uh, after 30 years, somewhat of a pack rat, and he was kind enough to send it to me. Thank you, Earl Miller, uh, at the White and Case firm for, for, for sending it to me. Uh, unfortunately, the findings of fact uh, weren't in there. I would have loved to reread them at 30 years later. Um, ultimately, we got a complete defense verdict. Exhibit one in our trial, of course, when Mr. the guarantor, the principal of the debtors, took the stand, was the judge's findings of fact. Of course. And, and, you know, that's how you led your, your cross-examination. And from there, it all went downhill um, for, the, for the debtor and, and debtor's counsel. So that's, that's where we uh, ended up. Uh, it is what I understand to be one of only two or three jury trials, as the judge said, um, in the district, of central district. Uh, it was a learning experience. Uh, I think at the time, and we, in our materials, we kind of walked you through the, the, the case law as it was emerging, we didn't have wellness. We didn't have a lot of the, the more recent cases that have come down about consent and the party's consent. So there was a great deal of, I don't want to say skepticism, but novelty of what was going on with the judge and kind of questioning himself, can I really do this in light of Grand Financier and Northern Pipeline and the cases that had, you know, during the, the two cases during the 1980s. So, your, your case is unique in the, in the sense that uh, your client was dead set against having a jury trial in bankruptcy court until the tea leaves started to become very clear. Uh, talk about the case uh, just from a practitioner's perspective that's before that, before you really get a good read on that judge. Uh, why would you 
sent to bankruptcy jury trial, and why are you trying to avoid that as a litigator? Well, I think it's a standard practice when you're answering any complaint where you haven't filed a proof of claim and where there's a, even, a, even a plausible argument that there's a jury trial, you should automatically be not considering the jurisdiction of the court and requesting a jury trial. You can always waive it later. Uh, you know, that's not a problem. But if you, you, don't, you don't know that, you don't know where the outcome is going to be, like our case. Although, as I pointed out, I think if you do decide to waive it later, by then the other side decide they like the idea, you might need their consent. But, but still, they're not generally, you're right. You can always give it up, but you can't. Once you've lost it, you can't get it back. But if, the, the, if it's the debtor, of course, bringing the lawsuit, or the debtor's estate or the trustee, they've consented to the bankruptcy court's jurisdiction if they filed the adversary proceeding. So, so I guess I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that if you're on the defense side of these things, you always want to make it as expensive as possible for the plaintiff. You want to delay it as much as you can, and here comes the jury trial demand, and here comes the, I don't want the bankruptcy judge to do this demand. Right, yes. Yes. Right. Anybody have a problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> so delay is part of the factor. Um, but then once you start uh, cutting to the bankruptcy judge and you like what uh, he or she is doing, uh, then you're willing to, to abandon that position. You have to assess it and, and adapt. I, I've seen it come up, in, in even putting aside the jury trial concept. I mean, there's lots of times when I'm initially dealing with parties where uh, the, the defendant's trying to get out of bankruptcy court, and then as they see that I have a, an even lower opinion of the other side than they do, they decide maybe it's not such a bad idea to, to be in front of me after all. So. Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this, this event has been sponsored by the financial lawyer, co-sponsored by the Financial Lawyers Conference, um, and we have a number of people on the, on the Zoom that are, that are members, as well as some of the other people in the community. Uh, FLC does an annual seminar, uh, which is in March, March 15th to the 17th, where we bring in a leading professor, either finance or bankruptcy. This year's bankruptcy. We're bringing in Tony Casey. Uh, we have uh, slots for 40. Right now we're at 37, so there's three spots open. For those that are interested, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and, uh, you know, there's still time to, to sign up. Uh, it's a little, you know, it's, it's at Terranea. Uh, it's, it's basically you're back in law school for, for three days. Uh, and you'll get assigned a topic. To, uh, Professor Casey uh, has done some wonderful materials that we're working on, and we'd love to see you there. Uh, thanks for the FLC membership that came out today. Um, thanks for that shameless plug. So let me make one now, and that is because uh, one of our BAP judges is the education chair for the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judge Conference in September in Seattle. What are, what are the dates of that conference, Judge Lafferty? September 19th to 20th. The September 19th Yeah, that's going to be a mock appellate argument, and we've got two Ninth Circuit judges and Judge Fair. Oh, you're going to be a busy fella, um, as, as our appellate panel, so there'll be lots of stuff. Judge yeah. Bluebun, are you going to sing for us at that conference? Uh, I'm going to sing for the judges. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, I promise we have a little Q&A at the end. Is there anybody that wants to ask a question of our expert who's done it before, of our local uh, uh, oracle, anybody? Yeah, we should ask, is there anybody who's tried a case in a jury, tri a jury trial in, in bankruptcy court? Who's here? Ah. Buffer. Maybe. Okay, we got another hand in the back. Oh. So maybe he was going to have one, but then he didn't. Yeah. We, I kind of asked my colleagues, and, and what's, I heard another rumor that Judge Rizzolo had done one. He said, no, the only one I was able to find was you know, the one with Judge Ryan and the one in front of Judge Mund. So I don't know if there really was any more or not. I know there's a judge in the Middle District of, uh, of North Carolina that has tried two or three cases in the last few years, uh, Judge Calloway, uh, Judge uh, David Jones of Southern New York, not Southern Texas. Uh, he, is, he has tried a case, uh, a jury trial. And right now in May is another trial that's uh, set for another bankruptcy 
judge in the Southern District of New York. So it does happen, uh, but the stars really do have to line up, uh, and, and you can see some of the obstacles that occur here. He has a hand in the back. When I, when I was talking to her about it, she was, went into great detail, but she, it was, I guess maybe I asked the wrong question because the, the answer that I got and the explanation I got was really kind of telling me what to watch for and how to do it if I was going to have to do one. And she was very practical thinking about things like if it's going to go through the lunch hour, you need to figure out who's going to pay for lunch, and you got to have somebody take orders for the jury. So it was very practical, um, but I'm not sure there was anything that I could distill that would be you know helpful for, for this group particularly. I think so. Yes, I think she did. Yeah. And then she, she did it only part of the day. Like, she'd break at like 2 o'clock so that everybody could go back to their office and get work done. And she could hear the rest of her cases because it went on for some time, which everybody seemed to like. So that was a good way to do it. All right. So we've got a few Central District of California bankruptcy judges here. I see Judge Barish in the back. Uh, do you want to do one, Judge Barish? Try to repeat the question, sort of explain yeah, her answer to statements. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, he, he was saying, how was it, it's easy enough to explain what the concept of murder, but was it harder talking to a jury about, like, lender liability and more complicated uh, principles, and did you get a chance to interview the jury afterwards? And, and there was probably more to it, but that's all I can remember at the moment. Yeah. The, 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 of course, our case was, you know, covenant defaults and arguments, very technical accounting issues. Which was, you know, when you have a jury, no offense to the juries in Santa Ana, um, you know, it's not the most sophisticated uh, jury. Uh, but I think the jury, and when we did interview them afterwards, Judge Ryan's order was on, on conversion was, everything else was secondary at that point for them. Um, they, they just, it, was, it was so so damning that that, um, that they couldn't overcome any of the accounting experts that they had. We're about to get the hook, but let me ask Judge Bordeaux, another such District of California judge. Jury trials up or down? Yeah, there we go. Thumbs up. Okay, right. I was going to say, jury instructions would really come in handy in when you're dealing with complicated issues because they've got a piece of paper explaining it to them. That, that should be helpful. So, well, we're, thank, we're getting the hook. Thank so, you all for hanging in there until 734, and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. <laughs>